IFAW presents uh, Elephant of Botswana, a conversation for African and Asian elephant conservation. I have a couple of house rules and I would request everyone to kindly follow the same. Uh, please keep your audio and video off at all times uh, so as to avoid distraction and uh, any background noise. Uh, for those of you who have uh, logged in with your email ID, I would request you to kindly um, use your names instead of your uh, email ID. And um, all the participants are requested to kindly uh, post your questions in the chat only. And do tell us uh, to whom the question is directed towards. So without um, much ado, let us start with the event today. I would briefly like to say a few words about the organization, or rather, since we've already said that it is not an organization. To introduce Friends of Elephants, it is not an organization and not proposing to become one. It is an informal group of people coming together with varied expertise concerned about elephants and other wildlife. The group is a forum for disseminating knowledge linked to elephants and other wildlife science, conservation and welfare through art, culture, literature, movies, talks and panel discussions. Our expectation is that people who have attended our events conducted where policies for remote and wilderness regions are developed on their own or with their proximity to people from policy making help in developing appropriate conservation and welfare measures for wildlife, including elephants. The schedule for today is as follows. To begin with, we will have a talk by Professor Rudy Von Art um, called Botswana, a room where elephants roam, followed by conversation um, between Mr. Vivek Menon and Professor Rudy Von Art on why did elephants die in Botswana? Implication for elephant conservation in Africa and Asia. And we end with the Q&A uh, with Professor Rudy Von Ard and Mr. Vivek Menon, moderated by Mr. Ankul Chetty. To begin, before we begin with the first part of our uh, event today, I would like to introduce Professor uh, Von Ard. Kindly give me a minute. Right, I think I'll, I may have to minimize because I'm not able to read the entire um, set there. To introduce uh, Professor Rudy Von Art. Professor is a, a full professor at the Department of Zoology and Entomology uh, in the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences of the University of Pretoria. He is widely recognized for his research on the ecology of elephants, especially for the development of mega parks for meta population concept that focuses on causes rather than symptoms of conservation issues. He has authored or co authored 175 peer reviewed papers in prestigious scientific journals, 11 book chapters, and numerous popular articles. 58 PhDs and MSc students have completed their studies under his supervision. Professor Rudy is an active member of several scholarly uh, societies, regularly uh, reviews paper for high impact factor scientific journals, and frequently advises industry, government, and conservation organizations on conservation related issues. The University of Pretoria has awarded him for exceptional academic achievement on four occasions and he is a fellow of Royal Society of South Africa. Professor Rudy, I would now invite you uh, to please kindly present with your talk. Anusha, you can share his presentation. Right. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for giving me an audience. 
and bear with me as I'm not that computer illiterate, but I'll try to do my best on the side. And I'll try to stick to time, although I'm very well known not for doing it. I have not selected the topic. I'm not that knowledgeable about elephant or woman. Now I have spent some 15, 20 years in looking at them and therefore would like to share with you a summary of thoughts on this population. Well, why this population? In my mind, in Africa, the elephant population of Botswana represents probably one of the only natural elephant populations left in Africa. They are spread over a vast area. They occur in relative good numbers and they are extremely, extremely kind in providing us with insight. Next slide, please. Can we have the next slide? Or do I do something? Or how do we make progress from this one? No, I, I shall be helping you out, Professor. Okay, thank you. Will you? Can we switch to the next one? Yes, yes sir. Like, are, you, yeah. are you able to? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just looks like there's a slight hitch. Yeah. Uh, tiny bit. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. When when the name of the country Botswana comes up to you. It's important before we consider elephants to actually consider people. It's a relative big country. It stretches about 580 square kilometers. The 2.3 million people live there. Only 2.3. I think the same mobile you may have on one of the streets in Delhi on a busy Saturday evening. Few people, relatively poor, politically extremely stable for many, many years, with elephants living in protected areas and beyond protected areas, and spread over an area of at least 100,000 square kilometers inside that country. So, we are dealing with a non-fragmented, relatively large elephant population that are not exposed, exposed to a lot of human activity in some areas. The people in this country are relatively poor, but are extremely well orientated to nature. The elephants in that country, in general, are well orientated to people. The elephants in that country are surprisingly timid and surprisingly informative for you are seeing them in their natural environment and if you keep your distance, you see them without interference that so often other animals or other elephants in other places are exposed to. Next slide, please. Do I switch to the next one? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. I'm so sorry. This looks like there's a... Okay. This is not good. I'm sorry. Anusha, can I try it out? Can I share? Yes, share? yes I'll you. try it. Thank Professor Rudy, I'll share your presentation. We'll just try if it works. Okay. Otherwise, I can try to do it from here.
Okay. Is the presentation visible to everybody? Yes. Okay. So I think it's working. So I'll do it for you, Professor Rudy. Okay. Next one. Next one, please. Next one. Much of what we know about the infrastructure. No. Go back. Go back, please. Maybe, Maybe I can do this from here. I think it's going to work the best with due respect if I try to share my screen with the presentation from here. Uh, so let me try that. Okay, we'll just try it one more time. If it's not working, then you can share. Okay. Yes. The previous slide then, please. Okay. Thank you. I would like to introduce this man to you, uh, Michael Chase, who for the last 20, 21 years have spent all his time working on elephants in Botswana. So much that we do know about those elephants, their numbers and distribution, the way they use land and so on, comes from his work. Next slide, please. So, from this work, we know that the population of Botswana recovered from colonial exploitation. Before such exploitation, that country had an estimated 200,000 elephants. Exploitation stopped about 70, 80 years ago. And that population recovered from about 32,000 animals to the present day 130,000 animals that represents a third of Africa's savanna elephants. These elephants are widely distributed, distributed and they are not confined to protected areas. They live in protected areas. These are in general not fenced off and they are free to move out of protected areas onto communal land, etc., etc. However, when they do so, of course, from time to time, we do have conflict between people and elephants. Next slide, please. The next one. The conservation challenges, challenges that we do experience in Botswana is very similar to those that we do see elsewhere. We first and foremost deal with fragmented landscape. Next previous slide, please. I think I should do it from this end, if you don't mind. Thank you. Naveen, maybe you can stop sharing and let uh, Professor Rudy take over from you. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know if you're um, here. All right. Can everyone see my screen? No. Um. Not it. Now we do, Professor. Yeah, now we can see. Wonderful, lovely. I do apologize for this. I think it's going to be much easier for me and hopefully for all of you that are listening to me. The conservation challenges that we do see in Bukwana are hardly different to those we see elsewhere in the world. We're dealing in general with the slight fragmentation. Fragmentation is more intense here in South Africa other parts of Guinea, etc. 
We're dealing with matrices, isolation, etching, area effects, all things that scientists like, like to roam about and do their work. We're dealing with exploitation, illegal activities, and we're dealing with the lack of political will that is at times. And then most importantly, we're dealing with the lack of capacity and we're dealing with conservation bureaucracies. I don't think any of these points are unfamiliar to any of you as these are difficulties throughout the world. Yeah, it's funny. We all, I think, are in agreement that our solution for all these problems, especially the problems associated with fragmentation, lies in the development of corridors and improved connectivity between protected areas or between isolated populations so as to activate ecological processes and get all the benefits that arise from this. And this is what I would like to explore today in the case of Botswana. The ecological consequences of the Vilipin corridors or enhancing or restoring connections is illustrated in this diagram. In red, you see the isolated or the unconnected state. And in yellow triangle, you see the desired state. Now that desired state brings about ecological processes and patterns that is good for conservation. First and foremost, it brings about opportunity for individuals and genes to disperse. It enhances the niche complexity, trophic complexity within a system and therefore stabilize ecosystems. And it allows us as conservationists to rely on stochastic by chance disturbance events to drive whatever happens in nature rather than our own interventions. These are all desirable things. The conservation of camps is equally nice. It reduces the likelihood of local extinctions. It maintains the genetic integrity. It improves the resilience that your ability to recover from a disruption or disturbance enhances biodiversity. And of course, as the likelihood of reducing conflict between species. I'm not here referring only to human animal conflict. I'm here more referring to conflict between, for instance, herbivores and plants, or carnivores and herbivores, or carnivores and carnivores, etc. The next one. This idea of designing networks is not new. It's very old. It's so old and so well advocated, especially by NGOs and recently also by governments. But the sad reality is we are hardly ever, ever taking time to measure what is the consequence of us developing these networks. We don't look at the functional responses of populations, for instance. And that to me is a major shortcoming. And I do hope to entertain you today by doing so. Next slide, please. Important is to realize that Botswana's elephants are not limited to Botswana. They don't have passports. They don't know in what country they are. They transgress boundaries. They go into areas surrounded with Sona, the five main other countries in Africa. They go in there, go out there, etc., etc. Here you are looking at elephants crossing the border between South Africa and Botswana. So, 
if you think of this and you look at that green blob in the middle of the map there, and they illustrating to you the distributional range of most of the elephants in Botswana. In red, to the far left, in other words, the west of Africa lies the Tosha cluster that's also having elephants. And then in pink, we have the, in Zambia, the Kafui cluster, and so it goes on. The point I'm trying to make is we have clusters of protected areas in Africa that have elephants that are living within the clusters, but not connecting between the clusters. The cluster in Botswana, the one in green, has about 220 to 250,000 elephants. That is 55 to 60% of all savannah elephants in Africa lives in that green spot. The next slide, please. My own idea and the idea of the group and the idea supported by IFOR for now 20 years of research on megaparks for major population has got a firm framework that's based on science. And the science here is based on meter population dynamics. And I'd like to spend a minute to share these ideas with you. This theory is a framework for spatially structured populations. The meter population here is defined as a network of local populations that live in discrete patches. So you can think of a group, a cluster that has a number of conservation or protected areas, each with a so-called population of elephants. But these are actually connected. So elephants can move from one to the next, which will result or should result in local extinctions not occurring, or if they do occur, they are negated by colonization that is a continuous process. And all of this gives rise to a regional stable population without interferences. From us. Next slide, please. How do we apply this thinking, this theory, the science? We ask very specific questions. And the question that I've asked in my work in Botswana is how is the population there structured across space? What happens to numbers over time? What drives the trends in numbers and the, the resilience? of the populations, and thus Kubernetes offer a solution for change if change were to occur. Well, next slide, please. So what I do, what we have done, is for all of Southern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, is to look at each of the clusters and define in each of the clusters so-called core populations, satellite populations, island populations. In the darkest colors, you see the core populations. They live in IUCN, one to four protected areas. They are well protected, they're such, there are no people, they are only animals. The satellite populations occur in the buffer areas around the cores. So a core has a buffer and the buffer is an area there where people live. And elephants from the core move into the buffer or from the buffer move into the core. But people occur there and the conservation flight is, is five or six in the IUCN categories. Animals can be exploited there, can, but, but it, they are protected by law. In the light colors of yellow here, is our, of the so-called island populations. Those are populations that do not have a buffer. They are isolated either by fences or by the transformation of the matrix that are embedded in. They are surrounded by people. 
that's a different class of population. And then on this map, I also illustrate in white blotches the populations, the areas of the way elephant populations have gone locally extinct over the last 20 years. So what you see here is you see a structure that is actually suggesting that elephants are distributed in our meter population as a functionally meter population. That is so only if dispersal could occur between populations. The islands clearly are not part of this meter population idea. Unless man interfere. Next slide, please. Now, let's look at Botswana alone. And let's appreciate that elephants will live where the environment is suitable. The cartogram, the map on your right hand side, shows habitat suitability based on about 10 layers of data on spatial data on human activity, on distance to water and distance to road, et cetera, et cetera, all those things we like to do as scientists. And it shows you where the ideal habitats or suitable habitats for elephants are. On the left is a map that actually, so when you people's presence into the model, you are getting a complete change in habitat suitability. In so far that people's presence displace elephant activity and give the impression that habitats were, were previously not so suitable are now highly suitable. So elephants, when competing with man for space, for habitat, are very quick to get in and to find other high habitat, often marginal for them, but as long as they can be away from people. This, of course, will have consequences for elephants, and I'd like to spend a minute or two to look at the consequences. Next slide, please. Before I get to those, let me illustrate to you. These are the highly suitable areas for elephants. Lots of water and green vegetation throughout the year in northern Botswana. Next slide, please. Here's the other extreme. The less suitable habitat. No running water. Water limited to fans that full with drain water, those white blushes. And the vegetation is sparse and not very green. This is marginal land. What I now would like to do is to make a comparison between this very outstanding green land and the brown land and how elephants respond to this. Next slide, please. What you see here is a very simple expression. I know there's lots of difficulties and there could be more simply complicated ways of saying the same. I have opted to make it simple here. In brown, you're seeing the marginal land on green, and in green, you're seeing the, the suitable, highly suitable land. And you see the area over which a breeding herd moves is very large in the dry season in the hinterland, the marginal land, the ephemeral water availability. And you see in the wet season, it's small, as, as small as it is in the highly suitable areas. The implication here for you is that elephants are wandering out in the dry season in the marginal land over a huge area, nearly two and a half times the size of what 
they would have done if they were in the ideal line. Next slide, please. The consequence of this for survival, and here I'll only look at survival in wind calves. They are three to five years old. And you see that those in the, in the marginal land have a very low survival index and those in the suitable land have a high survival index. So that the survival of the calves are compromised in the areas that is not so suitable. The next slide, Mark. Let's try to explain this. There's a lot of work in this simple slide. Simply here illustrating the home range on the x-axis during the hot, dry season and the survival index for wind calves on the y-axis. And as you can clearly see here, survival goes down as the range size increases. We have published the papers on this and clearly show the longer the displacement distance of an elephant breeding herd per day, the lower the survival of the weaned calves. So the cost of living in marginal land when displaced by, by humans for elephants seems relatively high. The consequence of this for population growth is, of course, that it induces a negative growth rate over time. And when these populations in the hinterland is, is isolated or are isolated from those in the good habitats, then you will over time see a decline in your elephant population. So here comes one of my arguments on the functional response of connectivity that is the desirable or that we desire for conservation. The next slide, please. This worried me a lot because of all of this is true. Then I had to get an answer to this simple question. And the simple question is, do elephants migrate? Now, as most of you will know, you simply have to ask Sir Attenborough and he will tell you, yes, they do migrate. We all know elephants migrate. However, if you put satellite colors on elephants and you let elephants give your answer, the answer is something very different. And only 18, one eight to 20% of elephants in a given area do migrate. The others are sedentary. So only a fraction of the population are not homebound and will migrate. The big question now is why do you migrate? Why might take the trouble of migrating. And we've looked at a huge number of variables and the strongest response that comes came out was the following, the next one. We went through great difficulty to estimate for, for 73 populations across Africa, the ecological asymptotic density as implied by food availability and water availability. And in this presentation, I show you the proportion of migratory animals in a population as a function of the asymptotic density that the animals are experiencing. So towards the left of the graph, when you are far away from your asymptotic density, when the art is very low, when you are very close to your asymptotic density at 80% density there, the tendency 
to migrate becomes higher. So it would appear it's a simple matter of numbers at home that induce some 20% of elephants to pack up their stuff and migrate. And this is extremely important because if you want to develop corridors to connect populations, you expect that the animals will move and that you will have a certain outcomes there. But in Zabana elephants living here in Southern Africa, only a, very, only a fifth of your population may migrate, all depending on how close their numbers are to the ceiling in the area from which they migrate. I hope you take that very important point home, Vivek. Next slide, please. It's one thing to migrate, but one of the promises of connectivity is that you will maintain genetic integrity. And so I here have asked a simple question. Do elephants disperse their genes? Now we looked at mitochondrial and nuclear DNA pattern, patterns of mitochondrial and nuclear DNA within and between populations based on material we collected from feces. This is ongoing work, but some of our early findings illustrates the point here. Next slide, please. When you look at this diagram color, I showed you in green blobs the locations of elephant populations. In blue, you see sites where we have sampled elephants, mitochondrial and nuclear DNA. In light colors, you see the likelihood of connectivity, and in darker areas, the likelihood is lower and lower and lower. And lo and behold, Botswana's Chobis elephants are actually connected to those in Kruger National Park. That's a distance of only about 500 kilometers away. It's a distance where people are living, but where individuals over time are finding opportunity to move and spread their genes. Of course, connections were in the past, those based on what we could see evidence from in mitochondrial DNA, but the nuclear DNA tells us that this connectivity is still continuing. So if we wish to do anything that will benefit elephant here, it asks us to develop connections or maintain connections from Chobi to Kruger in this case. At present, we are investigating such connections from Chobe up towards East Africa to eventually let them have in Amboseli or Tava or places like that. That is, if we can find evidence that functional connectivity that exists and may continue to exist if we give them the right opportunity, that is if it is required and there is a demographic reason for doing so. The next slide, please. And now would quickly like to look at the meter population function here in Botswana. The map is northern Botswana. In dark colors, you again have the core populations, the Chobi, Muremi, and then in Zimbabwe, Obongi populations. In light colors, you have the satellite populations that form the buffer surrounding. But interestingly, yeah, you have one island population right in the middle of them all. It's an island population because it's fenced up for and towards the west 
by a deep channel of water. So that number 12 you see there is an island population. The other numbers in light color are satellite or buffer populations, and those in dark colors are core populations. Let's look at the dynamics of each of these. The next slide. I think it's interesting. What you see on the left histogram there is your core populations occur in variable but higher numbers than the populations in the buffer or satellite areas. And then you see that one island has got quite a high number of elements, but I won't so much about that now. When you look at densities, animals per square kilometer, you also see the cores support higher densities than the buffers, but the islands support quite high densities. More important is when you look at growth rate, you see the growth rate of the core populations is about zero. This is data that has been collected over a 24 year period, a one generation interval for elephant. You see that the growth rate in buffer areas are either very high or very low, but in general, variable. And I know it's only one sample, but in this island population, you have an extremely high growth rate. So what you see here is that your cores, which demographically, age structure-wise, and so on, are no different to buffers, but have the opportunity for individuals to disperse, to move away maintain over time a near zero population growth rate. That the variability in growth rate induced in the buffer areas is a function of this. But in the buffer areas, life is not very good. And this is where you come and you're hunted or you're exploited or you are fearing for humans and you move back to the buffer and survival of your young is not very good course habit that is marginal, their growth rate over time will be negative or highly positive and will be very unstable. So you see a situation of high resilience in the core and low resilience in the buffers. In the islands, you see total pathological demographic indicators. Next slide, please. I would like to look at this island in a little bit more depth. And what you see here in very psychedelic colors is the movement patterns of a number of elephants that we have satellite colored in that area. I hope it's clear to all of you that in this triangular area that is surrounded by rock black dots which indicate fences and the black okovanga delta with the deep channel that the elephants there never crosses these boundaries what you also should see is that the elephants in the surrounding areas do not cross these boundaries so what you effectively have here is you have an open population around but within this area, island, you have a closed population. This closed population has a demography that's very different to those that are east in the surrounding area. I'd like to illustrate that in the next slide, please. What you see here in, on the green screen, let's focus on that. You are seeing on the left this area, I call it the Saronga area, and you see numbers over time, and you see a growth rate of nearly 7%. And you look at the adjacent land outside where dispersal takes place, 
and you're actually seeing a growth rate that is not significantly different from zero. My lily here on elephant dung that I photographed at and naturally in Northern Botswana, I didn't put the lilies there, they came out themselves. Is in respect for the recent mass die off of elephants on this island by the artificially high density and high growth rate and high contact rate plus fear for humans along the water stream where there are now a lot of people living forces those elephants to actually concentrate in the backland area likely having a high contact rate that gives all the ecological conditions for the possibility of a highly contagious pathogen spreading amongst the elephants that may have caused the caused the die off of elephants a few months ago in that area and the, this die off didn't occur elsewhere in what time so there are ecological reasonings that I keep up as causes for the die-off that is a symptom of something that has gone wrong. I'm not saying that it has been caused by a contagious disease, we don't know, it may have been caused by polluted water, but whatever the case is, this system, this island is so artificial that the individuals living there are exposed to these artificial conditions that, that increases the likelihood of die-offs. Next slide, please. My solution for all of this lies in connectivity conservation. In my old age, I have not come up with any other better solution that I can argue with scientifically. I have other emotive reasons, but I will not go into those. The next slide, please. How do we do this? I think we stop to define the needs of people. We rather define the needs of elephants. We locate the places that will address their needs. We define how to link them to these places. We, like you, have done so well in Asia and across Asia, Asia map the connections. But what we all are suffering from and not have done is to model the, the responses and see if those are the outcomes and if those outcomes are the ones we would like. Next slide, please. My whole idea about Botswana as a room to roam for elephants is actually founded in science. It's based on the needs of elephants and the benefits of others. It's a proactive conservation measure where you are accountable and it may rescue populations from local extinctions, maintain diversity genetically and it most importantly retain ecological processes. Next slide, please. I would like to end by showing respect to you, not for entertaining me so wonderfully back in 2018 when I visited, but also of sharing in the scientific literature for instance, this piece of work in Malaysia, where you are designing a landscape connectivity or based on landscape connectivity, a possible conservation for solution for elephants out there. I have never been there. I don't know what is on the ground there. I see the outcomes and I see the interest of, of developing these. Most importantly, however, is what I see lacking is to measure what is the outcomes of all of these activities. Thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity to address this. And I do look forward to, to address any questions you may have on it. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Ruri, uh, for presenting such a deep and holistic picture about the elephants of Botswana. As the next part of this event is in continuation of your presentation, I would uh, now move on uh, by presenting about uh, Mr. Vivek Menon, a brief introduction. Dr. Menon is a leading uh, Indian wildlife conservationist, environmental commentator, author, and photographer with a passion for elephants. The winner of 2019 Clark Bavin Award, the 2018 Whitley Continuation Award, the 2017 Samskara Round Glass Ach Lifetime Achievement Award, and the 2001 Rufford Award for International Conservation for his work to conserve the Asian elephant. Menon is the founder, executive director, and the CEO of the Wildlife Trust of India. In the international arena, Mr. Menon is the current chair of the IUCN SSC Asian Elephant Specialist Group, a member of the Species Survival Commission Steering Committee, and a member of the Conservation Translocation Specialist Group of the IUCN. In India, he serves on a number of governmental and non-governmental boards and committees and was a member of the Elephant Task Force of the Ministry of Environment and Forests that suggested a complete revamp of India's elephant conservation strategy. He has in the past served on the Project Elephant Steering Committee, National Wildlife Action Plan Committee, Sites uh, Advisory Committee, Governing Council of the Central Zoo Authority and a member of several state advisory boards for wildlife. He is the author or editor of 10 wildlife books, including the best-selling Indian Mammals, A Field Guide, scores of technical reports and more than 250 articles in various scientific and popular publications. Indian Mammals is a landmark publication, being the first of his or in independent India to be written by an Indian. It has been translated into several languages and printed in several editions around the world. Over to you, uh, Dr. Menon. So, right. that, yeah, sorry. Thank you. That, that, that was painfully long uh, presentation uh, of my attributes. It was a painfully uh, less painfully <laughs> long presentation by Rudy on the state of Botswana's elephants. I'm afraid the technical glitches that happened at the beginning means that we have uh, less time, I'm sure. Um, and therefore, I, I'll dive straight in. Rudy, uh, let, let's, let's, let's chat a bit. Uh, and let's chat a bit on, on, the, um, on, the, on, the, uh, on, on what you have said. For Botswana and elephants or uh, on a broader African sense and, and the uh, implications for Asia. So uh, the, I mean, broadly, your large presentation uh, in concise is that the, the elephants in that island population, island because of the fences and because of the water channel, has caused a certain density, a certain growth rate, and the inability to connect to other populations, which has caused the mass die off. Uh, not speculating on what is clearly a natural cause, uh, but not speculating on the exact cause of that die off. Now, if you take this, uh, this whole problem and, and bring it across the Indian Ocean, using old channels, an Arabian Tau or whatever, and bring it into Asia. Okay, we, we are now coming into a part of the world which is 56% of the world's population, human population, okay? Uh, and um, a, a third, perhaps, uh, of the world's poor uh, in, in that part of the world. And uh, around 50,000, 40, 50,000, give or take, Asian elephants to fit in this landscape, all right? So uh, unlike the African situation uh, where the, the ability to move across vast landscapes have been cut by fencing in this case, but not necessarily by very large number of humans. Uh, 
in the Southern African context, not in an entire African context, but in the Southern African context. In Asia, uh, just the sheer crush of humanity uh, will ensure that high density uh, and, and will ensure perhaps an island effect that you're talking about. But let me not second guess that. What I want to ask you is if, if you were advising a government in Asia, be it India or Sri Lanka or Malaysia, you've been to to India, I know, you, I, I, you, you said you've not been to Malaysia, that does not matter. Theoretically, what would be the three major differences to what you just spoke about in the Botswana context to Asia? How, how would things change in Asia purely theoretically for an elephant? Three differences. Uh, first of all, people, people, People. Three things, people, people, and people. people. Yeah. That's the difference. The conservation ethos out in Asia, in many places, in India specifically, is the consequence of something that's in the culture. There is a conservation culture independent of the landscape or the land or the number of people or the number of elephants. In Africa, conservation is the consequence of colonialism. It is a response to exploitation that was associated with colonialism. And following colonialism, we've set aside colonial, this started it, but following colonialism, we set aside in sub Saharan Africa one fifth of the land for conservation. That makes us very different to you, but our conservation ethos and yours are different. So our reasoning will differ. However, Let's focus on the similarities ecologically. If you are recognizing that you cannot have a core and a buffer and connections, then you have to live with it, the reality of living with islands. And when you live with islands and you don't want pathological responses of populations, you have to manage these islands intensely. Mm -hmm. And management in itself is unfortunately a very complicated human activity. It's more than often, in my experience, based on personal opinion or quack science, quasi science, not real science, it often focuses on systems and causes. So if I was I were to be your advisor out there. I would go to these places on a long and extended safari with my camera for a bit, and I will advise you on management, on scientific reasoning. And much of this will be directed at manipulating how elephants use space and how elephant numbers change over time. That's a long response. <laughs> yeah, no, it's an interesting response too. Um, uh, now, one thing you didn't talk about, but which I know you have a view on, is uh, how water, the availability of water, whether natural, which you showed, but mm -hmm. also artificial, which many of our managers, whether in Africa or Asia, now that's, that's a similarity in a sense, use. Uh, in response to what they see as a management problem. So water holes are dug for elephants. Water holes are dug sometimes not for elephants, but for tourism. Uh, yeah. so, so there's artificial densities being created uh, across Asia uh, and Africa uh, yeah. for management reasons. Would this, would this you think, also concentrate elephants uh, in, 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 in ways that could expose them to such uh, diseases indeed. and such things. Indeed, and, and uh, when you have these 
artificial water sources and they get polluted or they get affected by poisonous algae or whatever and the quality of the water is reduced you can have a diet but the point is if you think of water in places other than rivers those are rain waters that are collecting in the rainy season and drying out every year their location is not every year the same place so water points in nature move around all the time they are relatively small they will have water for three years or five years or six months and dry out artificial water sources are being maintained for 20 30 50 years at the same time giving rise to all the negative concept ecological impacts that elephants are blamed for so it's actually not the elephants that are to be blamed it's the man or woman that do the foolish thing of having a water point for decades centuries on the same location if you want to manage water close open water points satisfy tourists close those water points open new one satisfy tourists satisfy elephants etc etc so you have a specially and temporary dynamic management system and i think we all can live with that very well. yeah great so now, now let's come to i mean it, it's obviously a, a disease or a poisoning or something which is a proximal cause and, and and we have dealt and you have dealt in great detail that Essentially, it's isolation or, or, or an island effect, which is the distal cause, and connectivity is the solution. But let's just come to the proximal cause because there's something that that's very interesting in this whole thing, which is uh, that there was this mass die-off, hundreds of elephants died, caused global outrage. But actually, uh, what you uh, passingly, fleetingly said in in the initial parts is that it probably has not caused too much of an impact on Botswana and elephant populations. Uh, a large elephant population roaming over a huge area and, and a very small isolated island pocket is the one which has got affected. So tragic for those elephants, but not a conservation disaster for either Botswana or African elephant populations. Now, let me bring that back to today's age of uh, fear of diseases and Corona times that we are talking you and I sitting in our homes instead of in the field. Uh, is, is it a blessing to sometimes have these isolated pockets in terms of, um, it's a provocative question, I, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, oh, yeah. no. because uh, I mean, because it was fenced, because those elephants couldn't move, that, that whatever the cause was, that natural disease or poison, could not spread if it was an infectious uh, disease. Do, do, do you think there's that point as well? Thank you. Indeed, you touch a large number of points here. Yeah. Let's look at the last one first, that of connectivity enhancing the spread of the contagious diseases. Please remember other factors also have to be right to create a platform for a disease to be transmitted. If you roam widely, but you make contact with very few individuals, you are not spreading the disease. If you roam over a short area, but you make contact with a large number of individuals, you spread that faction, function. So we have to take these ecological factors in consideration. If you are a diseased individual already, your likelihood of picking up another is higher. If you are stressed because you are living in a very dense society where you are persecuted by people chasing you away from good water sources because their fields are there, you are stressed and your likelihood of picking up a, 
contagious disease is so much higher. So my argument in favor of everything here is to reduce the tension, ecological and behavioral, through connection and therefore reduce the likelihood. Let's get to your earlier point. Is this a conservation disaster? No, it's, it's not. Mm. As a matter of fact, the early writings in ecology is full of diseases being very important processes that maintains populations. There are thousands of examples in the literature over time of it happening. Yeah. However, the media loves attention and they love to have a good story. And the die of, of elephants in Botswana at the time when Corona was picking out people throughout the world was just a bit of news to flourish on. As soon as you give the ecological and conservation reasoning to them, they lose interest in the story. Every year over the past 10 years, where incidences of mass die-offs somewhere in Africa of elephants, either through drought, through poaching, through disease, or whatever. But all of this are often just localized. Thank you. Yeah. Now, no, uh, keeping, keeping the disease part to the side and coming back to your, your central uh, uh, preaching, which is uh, connect populations. Now, in, in, in Asia, when you come to Asia, uh, I'm sure if you talk to any scientists working in Asia on elephants, as well as managers of elephants across the Asian range, the very first thing that they would possibly think of is conflict. And when we talk of conflict here, we're talking human elephant conflict, not carnivore, 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 herbivore, we're talking elephants and humans. Now, in the Indian context, for example, about 400 humans are killed a year, or more than that sometimes. Yeah, so it, it's yeah. conflict apart from crop damage and uh, and and mm -hmm. property damage and 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 uh, uh, destruction of both elephant populations as well as uh, elephant herds may not be population but elephant herds as well as people. Uh, in in such a situation, would you? Uh, I mean, you. I know you don't have such a situation in Southern Africa where you work, but do you think your your whole concept, um, your concept of metapopulation uh, um, linkages, which may not be possible in very fragmented areas in Asia. But do you think that linking whatever subpopulations, whatever, uh, whatever mobility is possible within the population, within the population, even if not linking populations, is an essential um, tenet of solving human elephant conflict? I think. Around this one of many years ago, when I developed the idea in Mozambique, where we had one of the first connections between two populations, one in Mozambique and one in South Africa. And we were, had to work in human dominated landscapes. And we did so. We looked at the elephants and how elephants move and designated to the air. And what we did in return in that case was to fence people in and elephants out. That landscape allowed faith, that society allowed faith, and it is one of the great conservation stories in Southern Africa. There it was. World connectivity reduces HSE. Out your way. I don't think so. I think the part that will produce it is if connectivity and the building of connections, linkages, corridors, whatever you would like to call it, is a societal activity, one that informed, educated society do, then it will reduce conflict. 
because conflict per se out here in Africa have other ways of dealing with it than building connections. Building connections as a societal event and society activity that provide a essential ecological service to society through conservation when dressed in the right clothes and done in the right way will produce conflict. So yeah. I, I don't yeah. have difficulty in advocating connectivity as a, uh, as a solution for restructuring, restoring ecological and partially evolutionary processes. We need the evidence places still for this. But I also see it as a way that society accepts that the landscape is shared with those that provide services to society. The important thing missing here in Africa is that societies here do not always see the ecological services benefiting them. We still maintain huge portions of Africa for the luxury of trophy hunting, which some people call conservation out here. But the local society see it as exploitation. So you conserving to maintain colonial exploitation. Yeah. It's to me uh, uh, such a thing that modern society cannot live with. But the whole thing is conservation need to be modernized. You and yeah. I can't conserve yeah. the past. We have to conserve the future. Thanks very much. So, so you know, you, you, you've actually brought it brilliantly to my, the next thing that is uh, preying on my mind, which is how important are, are the attitudes of people. I remember uh, 25, 30 years ago when I visited your part of the world, uh, our, our, our esteemed scientific friend Richard Hoare had written a paper which talked about elephant um, carrying capacities. Mm. And um, uh, I'm, I'm not extremely sure. Uh, of, of the density, but we're talking two point something. So 2.5 yeah. or 2.4, I forget, something like that. It, this is in the 90s, early 90s. Um, uh, elephants uh, per square kilometer meant that you had reached a particular threshold beyond which yeah. Southern African regimes uh, could consider management options like culling. And I remember uh, thinking back to uh, the part of the world that I come from, Southern India, uh, that there were there were parts with, with three and four elephants a square kilometer, and we call it a national park, uh, and 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 uh, you know we considered it a, a heritage area. So what was the difference? And was it that the elephants were causing less damage there? No, they were causing probably much more damage here in terms of number of people killed, etc. But the difference, to me at least, was the tolerance of the southern Indian as compared to the southern African. And now this tolerance within Asia also will, of course, differ between Southern India and Malaysia or, or Vietnam. And you'll find there, there's a whole final uh, change as it goes along. So, uh, but, but when we try to manage elephants, we don't necessarily take this into consideration, do we? We don't, we don't look at the attitude and values and ethics uh, or societal objectives that we as human societies have uh, before looking at uh, prescribing one one management solution and, and using it across a range. Societal values, fortunately, in this part of the world is also changing. Yeah. And 30 years ago, those that came up with numbers for elephants had very much an agricultural mindset. Mm not the ecological mindset. Mm -hmm. What we know today is you don't look at numbers, you look at spatial configuration. You can have high numbers of elephants, but if you have respite for the environment, when they move seasonally or annually or for a five-year period, means that environment never gets destroyed, it's altered, it's maintained, 
by the spatial configuration, which is my big argument for having a media box where animals can be present in one place and absent, where you have local extensions and local colonizations on different scales, which is possible here in Africa, in Southern Africa in parts. It's possibly not possible, for instance, in Kenya, but it is happening in Tanzania. It possibly is not possible in your part of the world. And your corridors, your 100, 100 to 110 corridors, becomes and are maintained functionally. And you move elephants from one to the next over a decadal kind of period or five year period, where you are giving respite for regeneration, where you allow numbers to go up and down as time are going past. And you have to have a society that thinks this way to allow for this to happen. That is the only way you and I can, in our countries, live with elephants. The other way around is we live here with our elephants. And I don't want that. Rudy, there are several things I would have liked to ask you, and, uh, but I know we are running short of time, um, especially because of the earlier technological glitch, and I can see a number of questions coming in from the, from the participants. Uh, maybe, Uncle, uh, if you can uh, uh, moderate some of these questions and, and uh, bring a few of these in so that it's not just that the two of us are chatting, but we get in some of the participant questions as well. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, very insightful presentation indeed. And we have a lot of uh, questions coming as well uh, related to the same. Uh, so one of the questions uh, says, the uh, cyanobacterial uh, neurotoxins that has caused the death of uh, hundreds of elephants, still mysteriously enough remains the question, why only elephants and why only from that region? Why only from that area? Uh, I believe this question is for Professor. Uh, professor, if you could share your thoughts on that. Thank you. The report of the death caused by cyanobacteria comes from the BBC television station, not from science. It was a speculation by an American veterinarian. And she speculated this bacterium was present in the water. But samples never showed that the bacterium was possible. Then your question is fair. Why would only elephants die and not other animals? They are, after all, 23, 25,000 cattle in that area. And there are about 5,000 zebra there. They are about 17,000 elephants. Why only elephants? I have asked that same question, and the response that you get is no response. My speculation continues to be that this may have been caused by encephalomyocarditis caused factor that actually are spread by murex in their saliva on vegetation and to which elephants are susceptible. And the manner of death and the way that some of the carcasses were placed at it and caused sudden death of them falling on their knees and dying on their knees, not on their side of it, reflects on quick deaths in that dust, no disturbance, just a sudden death, implies there may have been a contagious disease. Samples were collected. None of the samples were fresh enough or intact enough to have shown anything. So until my death or your death, 
we will not know what caused 350 elephants to have died in the Saronga area. Sorry for that long answer, but I have to be responsible and give you the correct answer. That, that's indeed a very, very interesting answer uh, because, you know, uh, everywhere we read was, oh, was because of the, you know, the algae bloom is what caused the death. Really yeah, but as, 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 as Professor Rudy said, you, you are reading in the media. Yes, yes, if you, indeed. If yeah. you read scientific papers, it's uh, something else. <laughs> in fact, scientific well, papers have not even gone into speculation of what the cause of death is. Well, well there was a follow-up question from Kelvin uh, uh, with regards to that. But now that we are yes. ruling out this, this uh, as an option, let me slightly modify that question and ask this. So if we assume uh, these mass deaths are due to some climatic change, which is caused by human, do you have any advice as to how we can, uh, you know, handle these kind of events globally? And, uh, you know, if, if, if there should be any intervention that needs to be done and what should be our focus, what should the focus be? Our uh, that a question to me. That uh, it is looks a loaded that that is a loaded question because my answer is equally loaded <laughs> let's get rid of the ridiculous world leadership that ignores that the planet is in trouble and we are picking up signs. I don't say the diaph of <coughs> elephants, I talk of other signs, but we are seeing signs and we are experiencing an exponential increase on the occurrence of zoonotic diseases across the globe that has got economic and ecological consequences that are disastrous. And unless we start to invest properly in regaining our environmental and ecological services, we are not going to stop the spread of zoonotic diseases. For instance, most of these diseases comes from contact with generalist animals, with common animals that flourish in disturbed environments. That's your early primary uh, uh, successional species that comes in best proportions, that carries the, the factors, all the diseases that affects humankind. And these flourish only in disturbed environments. Intact environments have specialists Specialists have a low tendency of carrying any of these factors unless it's passed on to them by the generalists. So by us mistreating the planet, disturbing it all the time, having our environment disrupted, are actually creating the ideal ecological environment for zoonotic diseases that is disastrous. COVID is just one of the examples. And sorry for that loaded answer, but that to me is the cause of the problem. Thank you. Well, like you rightly said, it was a loaded question and uh, it indeed uh, uh, expected a, uh, you know, a loaded answer. Well, I see that uh, Brigitte has some questions. Uh, uh, yeah, C can you hear me? Am I on? Yes, yes. Oh, oh yeah, I'm a Brigitte. <laughs> I'm back to you two years ago. <laughs> Hi, Professor. Um, I, I am pretty much researching on a grassroot level in Assam. And um, I have a question regarding the migratory um, behavior of elephants that you have mentioned. And you said, if I recall this correctly, that um, guessing numbers are about 20% which do migrate. Did, was I there wrong? Please, please hear, me, hear me out for, for a second. Um, we have 
um, the situation, for example, in, in Assam that herds do split due to the disturbance by people. And that is so massive that these herds even stay, they do not go back to the forest, they just stay in tea plantations, raid the crop fields, come back to the plantation, and then eventually someday go back to the forest. Um, what I have seen and heard um, from a forester there is that uh, he op is observing that fact since, since years. And there's, for example, herds which have only one single tusker, teenage mm -hmm. tusker, yeah. Um, my question now comes, do you have any, um, huh, inbreeding is the subject. Do you have any um, evidence on, on inbreeding of, of these smaller and smaller herds, which have then only one tusker left, maybe for a couple of years, maybe even just take tomorrow, um, because they, okay. they're getting that, yeah, okay. the, these two things. <laughs> yeah, all Thank right. You. Thank you so I much. Can we can, yeah. I can, we can both take that, I mean, Rudy first. Can... Thank you, Vivek. Thank you for that question. First of all, our study on migration was based on 248 breeding herds that we satellite tracked for three years. Oh, oh. And of okay. those 248 herds, only 18% migrated. Okay, so it's not a guess, it's actually a value. Evidence yeah. for inbreeding in Africa are limited to the population in Adu Elephant National Park, where we have had the founder population of only 11 elephants. And over a period of some 80 years, heterogeneity declined. Okay. Mm. Not necessarily because of inbreeding, and you have to be very careful with that word inbreeding, yeah. I think. The fact that I can see you are Swiss, and you can see a Frenchman at the distance, and let me not speak of the English, you can identify them. We all are the consequence of inbreeding. We have our characteristics due to early inbreeding and then outbreeding, but maintaining that character. This also holds for other animals. Okay. My point is, when you are looking, for instance, for the elephant population in Africa, which we have the best data, happens to be the Ambuseli population on this. Only 5% of the bulls in that population breeds at any given time. The other 95% are having just a good time. They do not, no breeding. So you would think if that is the case, and elephants live so long, and a female conceive every four years in Africa, and they are sexually mature at the age of 12, the likelihood of inbreeding is there all the time, thou at low frequency. From the Luanga Valley, we have a paper that implies that the loss of tusks happen to have been the consequence of numbers having been lowered from 100,000 to 4,000 elephants in that valley, up to 12,000. 100,000 to 12,000 over 15 years, we had all the animals without tusks now forming a bigger proportion of that population. And that is being carried across. So if there are selective removal of individuals, we start seeing the inheritance of the tusk anomaly. We are not seeing it due to inbreeding per se. 
Sorry for that long answer, but I have to keep it. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Thank you. No, I think I think the great answer, Rudy, and I just just it perhaps is, uh, yeah. chip in very quickly to say a couple of things in the Asian context. Um, as you particularly, Bridget mentioned as well, but all over Asia. So the so the, the whole thing about migration or not migration, or or what percentage migrates. Um, I, I don't think we've had uh, very long-term studies in India anyway. But in any case, given the the size of uh, movement areas that we have, you can't really call it a migration in, in a larger sense. They're nomadic. I call them nomadic in, in, in Asian context. Others may disagree, but they do move. They're peripatetic. They move from one place to the other, but they're not uh, uh, hugely migration. Now, <clears throat> whatever cyclical migration occurs in some parts of Asia, where it's allowed to, is not being allowed to in Assam. As you rightly said, there's a lot of drives, a lot of uh, human interventions, whether by the government or whether by uh, public. And as a result, they're, now they're scattered. They're scattering, right? Uh, it's not even a, 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 a cyclical nomadicity. It's, it's, it's uh, anthropogenic cause scattering. Uh, so that's a whole different thing. Of course, this whole thing that you're talking about in breeding, I agree with Rudy. I, I, I am not worried about it at all. And you, one one male in a, in a in a herd, well, there should be only a couple of males sometimes, <laughs> other than young ones, and no, 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 no. and then they come and go. So I'm not worried about that. One male should not be sticking around that herd anyway, or that family anyway. So um, uh, we don't have very long-term studies, but I know there are people like Vidya and others who have started doing some of it. Vidya, I don't know whether you're still on, um, but. Um, we will get some answers to the to the uh, uh, eventual genetic consequences of these isolated populations, but in building yeah. so far. Yes, Uncle. Any more? Right. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, well, since we were talking about inbreeding and about uh, corridor, uh, so there is one question regarding the corridor. The question says uh, the presentation from the professor concentrates on uh, the larger landscapes or, you know, uh, seems to be a crossover for the large, large long uh, landscapes. How about small corridors locally uh, in a human dominated landscape matrix? Do you study this type of corridors uh, and what is the effect of, uh, you know, human presence is the question. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'm very fortunate and I am doing that. Uh, we are looking at the development of connections across Southern Africa, across these seven clusters that I illustrated to you in the talk. And many or some, or some of these are in new, very human dominated landscapes with small protected areas. The factors in the landscape that dictates the movements of animals they are all anthropogenic, are all man-made. In Africa, savannah elephants try not to come into contact with people. They avoid people. They will walk along a drainage line, and if there's a town, they will go on the perimeter of the town and try to avoid contact. If people are living around a water course, the elephants won't go there and drink in the day. They will go and drink at night when people are sleeping. So elephants in Africa that I work with uh, experience this kind of behavioral plasticity with them responding idiosyncratically to the specific situation that exists within a given place. The exceptions are the bulls in some cases. Bulls are very different. They will even, when persecuted, go closer to humans to get the crops. They are the animals that are selectively being shot and wounded also. They are the individuals that usually cause the conflict. I indicated to you in the previous question that only 5% of bulls brood, breed and the others are walking around for nonsense. Okay. 
So their incidental removal when causing problems is not a conservation disaster in the African scenario in most places. But them killing people or destroying crops are disastrous for people. So my solution there is therefore directed at doing something for people to protect them and collect against elephants instead of trying to do something to elephants not to do such. I hope I have expressed myself correctly here. Yeah, yeah and also even um, uh, the, the work that we are doing now in the 101 corridors uh, is exactly that. They're very small corridors, very small linkages. And um, uh, you can be in touch with uh, Sandeep or Upasna, both of who are on this presentation, and uh, they'll give you some work if you want to know of smaller corridors, few kilometers in sure. human dominated landscape. Yeah, yeah. Thank now, you. Our application Thank you. should be out quite soon. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. So there is also a question from Antriksh. Antriksh Gupta asks, why cannot we connect the national parks uh, with each other? So this is uh, both in India as well as in Africa. We are connecting. That, that is the whole project of right, right. of path. And, and several things are being connected. Just now, the, the Wynard Corridor that has been acquired, in fact, moving uh, two or three, relocating three, three uh, no, actually, uh, four villages uh, okay. of, have moved out voluntarily to, to give the land to uh, elephants and to other wildlife, elephants only being a, <clears throat> a, 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 a keys to more. A flagship, really. Uh, we have as connected uh, Brahmagiris to Vainard Sanctuary, mm -hmm. which will eventually connect to Nagaroli. So, yeah, we're connecting the parts. This is yes. exactly what we've done in India. And I know in other countries also, people have been trying to do this. In the African countries, nobody can talk about, but they're talking, his entire work has been on trying to bring the entire metaphor yes. across transformers. Uh, in Africa, the big thing there is now that uh, Rwanda has Connections call for international agreements here because our elephants do not have passports. They move from one country to the next and we need to get the international agreements to build or maintain these connections uh, between countries, between two countries, three countries, up to five countries. And there are NGOs hard at work all the time to actually facilitate these political agreements and to build further on these connectivities. The big thing to me, however, after all these years of dealing with this, 20 years of my life now on this, is will the outcomes be those that I have promised 20 years ago? Will connectivity really make a difference? And you, as a scientist, you have to be very responsible because you can't assume and then prove that your assumption was right. You have to assume that it will generate no benefit and then show that it generates a benefit or the opposite. That is then why we work with small linkages small parks, big parks, and big parks, big parks with small parks, buffers with cores, islands, etc., etc. And the answer to all of this is, I need another lifetime to get the answers. <laughs> right. Out, out of curiosity, uh, you know, I'm very sure uh, Botswana is different, uh, Oklahoma Delta is different. So how easy or how difficult it is uh, to connect the corridors? Let's, let's, uh, a very simple answer here. Connectivity is not a structure. You can't see it on a map. Okay. It is providing opportunity for this hand to meet this hand. I don't know if it will take the shortest route or long route or different routes or random routes or whatever. Corridors, on the other hand, is a structure with the least, least, least cost between my two fists. And you have 
politically designated society accepted structure. That is it. Connectivity is this ghostly functional thing that elephants dictate. Now, the land, either the least cost or the least difficult or to avoid people is, is amorphic. It hasn't got a firm place. You can't put a finger in. It requires the land to be kind of elephant friendly, but not so friendly that elephants will stay there. They Thank will you. only move through. Okay. They may only go and do it at night <laughs> or during the Christmas holiday season or whatever. And this is how you have to think of connectivity. Okay. Yeah. The break, for instance, the problem of inbreeding, if you have it, and isolation, you may need only one bull, one bull, every 10 years to go across and mate with one cow. Son. You don't need more. So we have to be so careful. And that's why my focus is more on stabilizing the demography, the numbers, the growth rate, the impact. That is exactly what the ecological things you and I can feel, not the things we have to think of and share with ghosts. And it's amorphic. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. We also have one question from uh, Dr. AJD Johnson. Uh, he asks if uh, hunting of bulls is supported in Botswana. Is it legal or is it allowed to hunt a bull in Botswana? The change of presidency in Botswana saw a change in attitude and with the Botswanan government uh, giving a quota for hunting of bulls in Botswana. A tremendous outcry from conservation, NGOs, etc. I think the media was wrong when they reported permission has been granted to kill 400 bulls. It was actually 80 bulls. And this hunting is to take place in selected buffer areas. The hunting is not in the core protected areas that I showed you. It's in those light brown areas. This area that I call the island that I showed the disease place, that little isolated pocket, also I have a quota for, I think, four bulls to be hunted there. The president of Botswana, the present president of Botswana, indoctrinated by several schools of trophy hunters have been convinced that trophy hunting is a conservation activity. Now, they have not convinced me. Let me stop there and say yes, there is a quota for legal hunting for limited number of bulls not in protected areas. Okay, Uncle. I have been satisfied, yes. Dr. John. Do we still have uh, time? Or? Uncle, Uncle, I have a, another important question about, you know, enormous, uh, looks like there is enormous uh, habitat degradation. Graveyard of trees, when you travel through Botswana, you know, you see graveyard of trees in the elephant habitat, all pushed down, killed. And uh, there is no regeneration of Sakami factory. I forget me the name of one breed, more like our lantern. It is everywhere, strong, so I'm smelling. No animal can eat it. So it looks like the habitat looks very suboptimal for the large elephant population we have in Africa. I think if the professor can um, comment on it, it will be nice. I would love to comment on it. And I would advise you to read scientific papers on the vegetation of that area rather than relying on you not seeing broken trees. The fact of the matter is that, yes, indeed, 
the river front of the Chobi River, the front of the Chobi River has very, very few trees and only a tree that is not eaten by any animal except kudu. Now, the interesting fact is that that Chobi National Park mm -hmm. 10 years ago had 34,000 elephants. The last come, last year, it has only 12,000 elephants there. The elephants have moved out of that park. They have moved to other areas where the numbers have increased. The depletion of the trees in the area along the Chobe River front started in 1970 with the sawmill being established and the big trees being cut to provide hardwood for furniture in England. Not elephants. I refuse to see the relationship between the number of dead trees and the number of elephants. I have gone out of my way in my life to sit and look at a dead tree to tell me how many elephants there are. If there are too many or too few, I still don't have the answer. I can assure you that the cause of death of trees along the Chobe River front is man-induced and secondly induced by changes in water levels and rainfall patterns which have dried out most of Central Africa over the last 150 years with dead trees of the same species and same sizes occurring across Namibia, across Botswana, across parts of Zimbabwe, right into Kruger National Park. These trees are died off in the same years and have not regenerated since. And in all those cases, the trees are of similar size, similar status, and the same species. We know that trees generate themselves in the African savannas as pulse events. There's a number of years and conditions that need to be ideal. Every now and then, maybe every decade, maybe every five centuries, that is ideal for the regeneration of trees. Thank you. And that is so much. By the way, is topic of a very, very long yes, presentation. Yes, so we have, we have uh, exceeded the time by 30 minutes. Uh, and we have two more questions. I am not sure if you would like to take it or if we should end the session today. I, I, I think, Uncle, if, we have, if, if it's not something dramatically new, then we've done most for the day. All right. Okay, yeah, then. I, something very, yeah. very different than you can do. <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, sir, I think it's a question for you, uh, more of, you know, asking if, if elephant can act as an umbrella species. You spoke about corridors. You spoke about you know the work you are doing with regards to joining the corridors. The question was in terms of whether it will benefit the other species. Uh, I think the simple answer is yes. Would you want to take it or? No, no. I'll, I'll very quickly take it, saying yes, of course. Uh, but umbrella. What do you mean? I don't know. What, I don't know what you mean. Is the keystone thing or use it as a flagship thing? Most of our conservation is flagship based and mm -hmm. not look what the elephant is doing to other species uh, ecologically in terms of uh, uh, corridors, but we're using the elephant as an ambassador, as a flagship to conserve that corridor, which will obviously help right. a lot of species. There's a different flagship and keystone. So umbrella is, a, is another, another word which is being used. But people have to know what they're using. That's, that's right, that's right. But yes, it is, it, it, it is all this and more. Yes. Thank you, thank you, uh, to, uh, Mr. Bannon and uh, Professor. Anusha, would you want to? All right, thank you. Well, uh, as just so engrossed in uh, the entire discussion, uh, and uh, as everyone's already said, yes, we have exceeded the time limit. Sorry about that, but you know nobody would want to interrupt such an interesting talk. So I would like to conclude by uh, thanking our guests.
Professor Rudy Von Ard and Mr. Vivek Menon. Thank you so much. Great talk, interesting points, discussions, very insightful answers. And thank you to all our audience, our participants, for uh, having spent this evening with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you to all that listened to my difficult English. Thank you and good night. Well, well thank, thank you, Rudy, and thank you for tolerating the, the massacre of your name. You're Rudy Fana. <laughs> not, not Bernard, but anyway. <laughs> so, so language on both sides. But, uh, but thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Apologies, Professor. For listening. By the way, fun art means from this earth. So I feel very proud.